Today, crypto prices rally after the Fed's first rate hike in more than three years. U.S. senators probe the world of illicit finance within crypto. And The Sandbox's Marcus Blesha explains how NFTs strengthen ownership in the metaverse. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World. I'm Kate Rooney. Cryptocurrencies are moving higher the day after the Fed hiked interest rates by 25 basis points. The market as a whole gained about 2% by noon Eastern. Bitcoin rose by a little less than half a percent, actually among the more modest gains in crypto today. Ether performed a bit better, rising more than 3.5%, and XRP rose about 2.25%. To find out what's next for crypto prices, including regulatory risk, Crypto World host Tanea McKeel spoke to Chris Matta of 3IQ Digital Assets. All right, Chris Matta, thanks so much for joining me today. The Senate Banking Committee, they're hosting a hearing on crypto's use in illicit finance today. Um, what do investors need to know about that hearing? And what, if anything, are you expecting to see come out of today's particular conversation? Yeah, so firstly is is um, what regulatory impact could come out of this. So one, I, I saw um, Senator Warren uh, proposed a, uh, a new bill uh, that would enable the U.S. to sanction crypto firms that are doing business with Russian entities. Um, again, this is in the effort of uh, trying to prevent uh, Russia from skirting sanctions. Um, I think what's crucial here and what we'll need to keep a close eye on is um, ensuring that we don't have overreach from a regulatory standpoint as a result of this conflict. I think historically you can look at any, any uh, uh, high tension situation or, or terrorist event or conflict and see, you know, the Patriot Act came out of uh, uh, certain large events like, like 9-11. And, and certain scenarios like this, you get this regulatory overreach because we're, we're making very quick decisions in, in a moment of crisis. Uh, and then that that's not necessarily good for individuals long term uh, or the, the bolstering of innovation in this ecosystem long term. I want to turn back to the prices. So, you know, investors continue to watch Ukraine and Russia. The Fed yesterday finally announced its first interest rate hike at the end of uh, its meeting, how are all of these narratives kind of affecting the price this week? They're walking such a fine line right now, trying to balance this, uh, where they're raising interest rates not too aggressively, where the market's going to you know sell off drastically, but they also need to make sure to keep inflation uh, in check. So you know, twenty five basis point raises, like that's what the market expected. Is that going to be enough to to slow down inflation? That's to be determined. Like, they may need to get more aggressive in the future. Um, but in terms of how the crypto market's been reacting, we're still in that tight trading range. So volumes are, are kind of down. Uh, we're, we're in this really tight window trading around 40 to 41,000 right now. And we've been in that broader 37 to 42,000 range over the last few weeks. And really, I think until there's clarity around these macro events, so whether the Ukraine Russia crisis starts to uh, come to an end, whether we start to see inflation. Uh, pull back a little bit. Um, I think we're we're going to continue to be in this side sideways uh, uh, moving uh, market for the for the time being. Tell us what happens next. Yeah, I think we're going to continue to trade in this thirty seven to forty two thousand Bitcoin range. Uh, the broader range, maybe over a six month time frame, is probably thirty to fifty thousand, assuming that we don't necessarily have uh, uh, the inflation and and more macro uh, headwinds all sorted through, which is likely to take some time. Um, so I think that's really where we're gonna continue to, to, to sit over the coming months. Uh, longer term, of course, when we zoom out, I think we always need to highlight that we're still very early in terms of the adoption curve of crypto. You know, it's 1997 in terms of the internet, but I think in the short term, uh, one to six months, the, the 30 to 50,000 levels is where we're gonna be sitting on, on Bitcoin. Okay, Chris Matta, 3IQ Asset Management, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks again. Okay, so let's talk about some of the crypto headlines. First, speaking of regulation, the Senate Banking Committee just held a hearing on illicit finance in crypto. The reason, at least from my perspective, why cash is a whole lot different than cryptocurrencies, it takes a lot of suitcases to transfer the kind of cash that you're talking about with 
what I believe is a simple press of a button in, in, in crypto. Regulation was top of mind for senators who said clearly defined rules are still needed. It seems to me that without some regulatory framework, without a cop on the beat, so to speak, you know, we are, um, we're at a great disadvantage in terms of cracking down on illicit use. Now, this hearing is happening just as eight members of Congress sent a letter to SEC Chairman Gary Gensler asking whether the agency's uptick in crypto-related probes could be considered improper use of the public's time. Next up, HSBC thinks the metaverse could be the next place to teach financial literacy. The bank is launching a set of financial games in the sandbox metaverse aimed at reaching esports and gaming enthusiasts. HSBC is partnering with Animoca Brands, the parent company of the sandbox, which has over 200 partnerships in the metaverse already. Those include Warner Media Group, Adidas, and other big brands offering their products to users. Okay, on to our main story of the day. Down in Austin, Texas, at South by Southwest, crypto world anchor Mackenzie Segalos spoke to the Sandbox's Marcus Blesha about growing adoption and digital ownership in the virtual world. So the Sandbox at the ground is a virtual world that we want to give, uh, like, owned by the players. So the ownership is belonging to the players. Anything that you see, any any character, any avatar, any house, any sword, anything really is potentially created and owned by a player. That means that it's a, it's a virtual world that is not operated by some centralized uh, company or organism behind, but it's completely user-generated content that is created by the, uh, by the community, by players, by artists, by anyone really. And the Sandbox is putting all of this into one persistent world where users can play, they can visit concerts, they can discover artists, they can meet each other and just uh, like explore this, this metaverse that we're building. So on a, very, on a very basic level, imagine playing any game, any video game in the past, um, and you, have, you buy an item, you have something that, that you like, like it's a, maybe it's a backpack, maybe it's a, maybe it's a hoodie, maybe it's an avatar itself. Um, in the past, when you buy this, it's, a, it's not yours. Like you have the rights of use, but it's not yours. Like you don't have the, you can't decide like, hey, I want to give this to my friend. Hey, I don't use this anymore. It's, a, it's not something that I want to wear. On the NFT side, we're changing this paradigm of ownership and giving it directly to the creator of it. So I can design a hoodie that I'm putting for sale on it and I get direct benefit from it. It's no, there is no middleman, but I can sell it directly to the end consumer. And this is the exciting part that we also see, which, uh, which had a lot of interest in the NFT space for digital artists. But as the space evolves, there's a lot of interest of like fashion creators, like uh, game makers, people that want to use avatars or that want to create their own like uh, universes and IPs. And on a very basic level, it's, it is similar to what is known in the past when it comes to uh, like digital assets, but we're changing the ownership to the community, to the, uh, to the player directly. So you, you can decide what you want to do with this piece of item that you, or this piece of asset that you bought, and it, it's an NFT. So it's my first time at South By and a lot of the feedback that we're getting when we mention the word metaverse is that people are thinking, oh, I'm putting on my headset and I'm in, the, in this world and I can do whatever. But that's not, that's not at all it. So we see actually a lot of metaverse applications that go, some of them are AR, some of them are like uh, XR. Um, however, most of them are really on PC and uh, mobile devices, which is virtual worlds or just environments that uh, can, can be described as a metaverse. So there is not one metaverse that uh, is all interoperable amongst each other, but uh, there's going to be various uh, collections, uh, spaces that are all their own little metaverses and that users can log into. So in our case for the Sandbox, this is um, on PC. Of course, we're having an eye on VR, on XR, on mobile, on like just emerging markets, especially like in the Web3 space. Uh, however, the focus for us right now is to have a, like, have a solid experience on PC and then go from there into other platforms. So, as the Sandbox is a UGC world, actually we're seeing a lot of interest from, uh, from creators that uh, want to create video games. Like we have a part of the Sandbox is we have, a, we have a portfolio of products that are made for UGC, for user-generated content. So we have a tool that's called Game Maker in which you can build experiences, you can build houses, you can build museums. We have uh, another tool that's called Voxedit, which is really to design assets and, uh, and to, like uh, equipment, avatars used inside the sandbox. And we see various use cases of uh, small teams of game developers that are building experiences for themselves or that are building experiences for one of the many brands that are already inside, our, inside the sandbox. We have partnerships with, uh, with Adidas, with Gucci, with Snoop Dogg. And um, we have communities like average, like average, like random users that are building for them now. They used to be teachers. They used to be like um, 
working in tech, but now they, they went into the space and they use Web3 to, to change their, like the, the area of work. And um, one vision that we also have is that we want to create new jobs that can be right now just uh, the creation of, of houses, like it's architects, it's uh, digital marketeers, it's uh, like really any, any like classical job that you can think of. We want to find use cases or an equivalent inside the sandbox or inside our metaverse. And uh, right now, the biggest attention we see on the creation side, because we are in a phase where it's really about like building the foundation of what the sandbox is going to be. And um, there already we have, a, we have, I think, like 50 plus teams that are full time working on building for the sandbox. And this is like, it's very exciting to see. But then going forward, we, we also have a lot of agencies, sports clubs, uh, like individual music, uh, music artists that, are, that really want to get into the space. Before we go, we talked to a lot more crypto investors and innovators at South by Southwest this week, so be sure to check back for more from Austin, Texas. That's all for today. Crypto World will be back again tomorrow. We'll see you then.